we've been talking about the <coughs> book of Revelation. And when people think about end time events and people are talking about <coughs> end time events, That's right. we think about the book of Revelation. In the <coughs> earlier discussion with Shama, we were talking about this fascination <coughs> with Revelation, but specifically in regards to certain verses that that uh, talk about like plagues and antichrist. But in your estimation, what is the book of Revelation all about? Uh, I agree with her completely that it, it's, it, it gives it, us the big picture of a battle between good and evil. Uh, it really helps us to step back and it's, it talks about the war in heaven a long time ago when Lucifer rebelled, became uh, Satan, took a third of the angels and then came down to the earth. It takes you down through history. It lifts the veil between, you know, uh, so that what we see we realize is not all that's going on. So it's really a battle between the good, the good side and the bad side between God and Satan. I also like the way you described Jesus coming on the white horse, which is where white horse meeting, that's where he picked our name. He comes as the hero, he rescues his bride, he takes her to the new Jerusalem, which is where uh, we, we all want to go. So it deals with that. It also, it talks a lot about Jesus. Uh, as you mentioned, it's the revelation of Jesus. That's the first sentence. So it's a, it's a book about Jesus, about the plan of salvation, about the battle between good and evil. It also tells us what's going to happen at the very end. God's going to get rid of sin. He's going to make a new heaven and a new earth. It takes you down throughout history and shows you the big players and shows you what the big uh, issues are at the end before Jesus returns. And it gives a lot of hope and a lot of promises that God's going to bring us through. So it's a multifaceted book, a lot in it. It's a deep book. It's the last book of the Bible. And I, I love the book of Revelation. Now, there's a lot of symbols that are employed in the book of Revelation. But doesn't it, the fact that it's symbolic lends itself to misunderstanding, misinterpretation, or multiple interpretations? Yes, uh, that's for sure. Uh, for instance, Revelation talks about something called the beast. So when Barack Obama was uh, president of the United States, he used to be driven around in a, in a big, black, sleek limousine, which they nicknamed the beast. So some people said, hey, Barack Obama must be the beast because he's being driven around in, the, in a car called the beast. So yes, as far as speculation, there's a lot of it. But when you really read the book carefully, when you compare it with Daniel, Daniel's like the Revelation in the Old Testament, book Revelation in the New, they go together and they give you principles of interpretation. So we know that a beast isn't a, a, a black limousine. Uh, it says in Daniel that the, that a, the fourth beast in, the, in Daniel 7 is a kingdom. The fourth beast is the fourth kingdom upon the earth. So there was four beasts in Daniel 7, a lion, a bear, a leopard, and a dragon, and those represented Babylon, Persia, Greece, and Rome. So there are principles that help you to understand the symbolism. Another place in Revelation talks about the water. And then in chapter 17, verse 15, it says, the waters are peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. So if you compare scripture with scripture, you learn the principles and it saves you from launching into the sea of speculation and thinking that a computer or a car uh, is the beast of prophecy. <laughs> Social security number, <laughs> yeah, careful of that. Right. Now, Shama, have you found that to be true? Do you feel that the book of Revelation can be understood by scripture itself? Absolutely. So I find that the Bible interprets the Bible. Mm -hmm. So when you come to something that's confusing or you have some questions about in Revelation, you can look back. A large percentage of Revelation is taken from language in the Old Testament. So when you look back to those verses in the Old Testament, it gives you the principles behind what it's trying to talk about and it gives you some understanding for what those symbols mean. Excellent. You know, there's been a lot of talk, especially mm -hmm. in the last number of months in regards to Israel. That's right. Now we know that the, the literal state of Israel, this nation has been a focal point of U.S. media, U.S. politics, U.S. religion. Now is modern day Israel, is that a focus of Bible prophecy? Not in the book of Revelation. When you read the Old Testament, it, Israel was at the center of, of what God was doing. When you look at the New Testament, there's uh, uh, some twists and turns there in the New Testament. And this is, um, I have a chapter in my book, which is kind of a shocking point for many people. It's called the shocking principle of two Israels. Just like we all have two eyes. And when you look through both eyes, you can see clearly. 
Uh, the, the New Testament in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 18, talks about Israel after the flesh. And then in Galatians chapter 6, verse 16, it talks about the Israel of God that is centered in Jesus, that is made up of Jewish people and non-Jewish people who together become what, what is called the Israel of God. So I do believe that uh, Israel is at the center of revelation, of the final events, but, I, but the question is, which Israel? Is it just the literal descendants of Abraham? Is it just the, the physical uh, Jewish state? Or is it Jewish people and non-Jewish people who are connected to God? And I, can, I build my case in my book, and, and I think it's, you know, if I had more time, I could show you lots of verses that there's no question in my mind that when you read the book of Revelation, its focus is the Israel of God centered in Jesus, uh, not just people who can trace their lineage, you know, back to, uh, back to Abraham. Like, as I mentioned, I grew up in a, in a cultural Jewish home. I, and when I was uh, partying and going to the discos and the rock and roll concerts, I was part of Israel, but I was part of Israel after the flesh, which means just natural, you know, descendants. But then when I accepted Jesus into my heart and he changed my life and opened my eyes, and then I really became connected to God, then I became part of the Israel of God. And so there's a big difference there. And I think Christians who study, especially in the light of the war, you know, when the war started on October 7, uh, the Christian world responded in two, two basic ways. Number one was we need to be praying for people over in the Middle East, and I totally agree with that. And the second response was they began talking about prophecy and how what's happening there is the key to the end. Uh, and that's where I think there's a lot more study that needs to be done on this topic. I know there are lots of Christian end time movies out there and they definitely focus, and Christian books, that focus on the literal nation of Israel as being the focal point of Armageddon. Right. And this is where the, the conflict at the very end of time will it'll all revolve upon this, this, this nation in the Middle right. East. Is That's that right. what the Bible teaches? Yeah, not the book of Revelation. It doesn't teach that. The word Armageddon is only used one time in the whole Bible, which is Revelation 16, verse 16. And when you read what happens before Armageddon and what happens after Armageddon, the word Jew isn't even there. It's not there. And the word Israel is not there in that context. And so, like I said, you have to read the context, look at the big picture. It's a very important principle. We need to get, get correct principles of interpretation. And like I said, I've been studying the Bible for a long time in the book of Revelation. In the Old Testament, the battle was between, well, there were many battles, but Babylon, the literal uh, nation of Babylon ruled by King Nebuchadnezzar, came south, conquered Jerusalem, uh, and took the Jews captive. So in the Old Testament, it was physical Babylon against physical Israel. When you look at the book of Revelation, uh, the book of Revelation talks about Israel and Babylon. But the Babylon in Revelation is clearly not the literal nation over in the Middle East in Iraq because there's just ruins over there where ancient Babylon used to be. Uh, and so when you look at Babylon in the book of Revelation, it's, it's described as a woman. Uh, riding a beast, sitting upon the city of seven hills. There's a whole lot of different symbolism showing that this woman represents global false religion. And there's more details of that. And so it's Babylon against Israel. And Babylon in Revelation is definitely a, a spiritual Babylon or a symbolic Babylon, not the literal nation. It's the same with Israel. Israel is also the people of God centered in Jesus. And the Battle of Armageddon, when you read the context in chapter 16, it's very clear that it's worldwide. It's not centered in the Middle East. It has nothing to do with the uh, physical state of Israel or the uh, you know, any temple that's supposed to be rebuilt over there. It's not a bloody military battle against Jews. It's a global battle between the forces of, uh, of the devil, the, the global forces of evil, deception, distortion against God. And the surrounding uh, focus is his people who are going to be loyal to him. And I just challenge anybody to read Revelation 16, verses 14 to 21, see the word Armageddon, and you'll see that theme very clearly when you actually read the book. So uh, this begs the question, why do many evangelical Christians and other denominations focus so much on the literal yeah. 
uh, state of Israel. Yeah, great question. I mean, it, it, it's, it's, it actually drives politics. It, it I know drives it does. funding. I know. Why is that? Well, a lot of it's because of, of Old Testament prophecies about Israel. So they read the Old Testament prophecies and they extrapolate from them to the Jewish state. But they're not reading the New Testament carefully and they're not reading the book of Revelation. And so uh, I think there's a lot of reasons. One, uh, this is one thing that I've, I've thought a lot about this, Anil. And when you go back to the time of Jesus, the, the rabbis, the Jewish leaders, the Pharisees, the scribes, etc., they had a certain path in their mind, a sequence of what was going to happen when the Messiah came. He was going to conquer the Romans, the hated Romans. He was going to uh, exalt Israel. He was going to rule from the throne of David. That's what they believed was going to happen. Uh, but they were wrong. They had a wrong sequence in their minds that was really designed to exalt themselves. And when Jesus came, he didn't come to do that. He came to die on a cross for the sins of the world and to rise from the dead. And so because Jesus didn't fit their sequence, they, they turned away from him. They couldn't, they just couldn't fit him into their program. And there's a big lesson, you know, they say, if you don't learn the lessons of history, we're doomed to repeat the same mistakes. And what's happening today is very similar, that there are religious teachers, prophecy teachers, and they have a path marked out in their mind of what's supposed to happen. And Israel is the center of their sequence. But it's, I, I believe what's happening today is very similar to what happened in the time of Christ. And we need to re, we need to carefully look at the prophecies and realize that the prophecies are not centered in, in the Jewish state, they're centered in Jesus and in his followers who are dealing with the world forces of evil. That's the, the lens, that's the correct, uh, if I got my glasses on, you know, that's the correct pair of glasses. If you put the right glasses on and read Revelation with a Christ-centered focus and Babylon being spiritual Babylon against Jesus and his people, then things fit into place. If you have the wrong glasses on, you're gonna miss the boat. That makes a lot of sense in considering the big pictures of Scripture, the big ideas of Scripture, because um, if, if we're, we're saying all of Scripture is just tending towards this, this uh, idea of what happens in this literal uh, small state in the Middle East, That's then right. what about the rest of the world? But I like how you pointed out that there's two kinds of Israel and the New Testament focus, the focus of Jesus, the focus of Revelation is the Israel of God. That's right. Now, what exactly is that? What kind of people are we talking about? Are we talking about people only in Maryland? Are we talking about people only in California? A particular church? What are we talking about when we say the Israel of God? Right, yeah, uh, that's the phrase Israel of God is in Galatians chapter 6, verse 16. And when you look at the context, Paul in verse 14 talks about how he said, I, I don't want to glory in myself. You know, he was Jewish, he was a Pharisee, he had all this education. But then when Jesus changed his life, he learned, he said, I'm not here to glory in myself, but I want to glory in the cross and what Jesus did for me. And then in verse 15, he says, it doesn't matter whether we're circumcised, which applies to Jews, or uncircumcised, which applies to those who are, you know, not Jewish, typically, just generalization. He said, but what counts is, is a new creation being a new person, having your eyes open so that God changes your life and makes you new and, and, and good and different and better than what you used to be. And then the next verse, verse 16 says, those who follow this teaching or this rule, he said, peace be upon them and upon the Israel of God. And so when you look at the context, the Israel of God is, is a group of people, just like God chose Israel in the Old Testament, brought them out of Egypt. So in the New Testament times, God chooses people from all over the world, from every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, different languages, colors, black, white, brown, red, you know, wherever Indian. you live. Yeah, Indian, yeah, don't want to <laughs> leave out the Indians. That's right. Uh, and so we're all together when we have faith in Jesus. They say the ground is level at the foot of the cross. So we all need to humble ourselves, realize that we're sinners, believe in Jesus uh, for his forgiveness and he changes us. And it's the people that are being changed in the process of being changed by the Holy Spirit and by the word of God, they become the Israel of God. And the book of Galatians is very clear on that. In chapter three, verse 29, at the end of chapter six, 
Uh, Paul also talks about in Ephesians chapter two, that Jesus came to break down the wall between the Jew and the Gentile and to make them both one in mm -hmm. him. And so my contention is when you really read the New Testament carefully, it's bigger than just the Jewish state. You know, that was the rabbi's view. Uh, it's bigger than that. And the problem is people just read the Old Testament and then extrapolate from that to the end times and say everything is centered around the Jew. But that's not true. Everything is centered around Jesus. The Bible is not primarily Israel centered, it's Messiah centered, it's Jesus and those who respond to him. That's the key issue. Steve, what would you say to the person who didn't grow up a Christian, maybe uh, is, you know, they, they didn't have a Christian family, they got no ancestors who are Christian. Right. Uh, maybe they were born in complete a, yeah. let's say just an Eastern religion and, and they don't have any of this. Right. Are they invited yes. to become part of the Israel of God? Is this invitation mm -hmm. open to people who aren't Jewish, aren't Christian, don't have that uh, background or Bibles in their home. Is this invitation open to them? Yes, uh, God loves everybody. He made everybody. Uh, you know, there's things about the Bible that are different from any other religion. The Bible's the world's all-time best-selling book. It's been printed in more languages than any other uh, book in the history of the world. Uh, and what, uh, you know, I, and when I first started reading the, reading the Bible, I came at it from just a blank slate. You know, as I mentioned, I was Jewish, but I knew nothing about the Bible. And so when I began to read, little by little, God began to open my eyes. And that uh, experience is accessible to everybody, you know, but a person has to make a decision and I had to make a decision. Do I wanna give up my parties and the drugs and the marijuana and the discos and, and do I wanna really start reading this book? And I wrestled with that, I call it the surrender syndrome. Am I going to surrender and am I going to really, you know, take this seriously? And I decided I'm going to do it. I'm going to read it. And the more I read it, the more it began to change my life. And that is available to, to anybody because Bibles are all over the world. They're the mo it's the most downloaded book uh, on a smartphone than any other book. It's more popular than Harry Potter. It's the, it's the, the book of books. And a person just has to decide, I'm going to check this book out, read it and see you know, what I find. And I'm convinced that if they do that, they'll find Jesus and they'll realize nobody's ever spoken like this man. There's nobody, there's no teacher, not Muhammad or Buddha or Confucius. Jesus is the only one that rose from the dead. Christianity is the largest religion in the world right now. And that's not without reason. There is power in Jesus and people that are willing to take a look, examine his claims, uh, they'll see the power and the love. There's no love like the love of a God who became a man and died on a cross for the Beautiful. sins of the world. There's nothing like it anywhere. Beautiful, well said. Thanks, Steve. Sure. We've been talking with Steve Wahlberg, author of Israel and the End of the World. When we come back, we'll open the floor to our studio audience for questions for Steve and Chama. Don't go away. Welcome back to Hope at Night. We've been talking with Shama Stock and Steve Wahlberg about the book of Revelation, the end of the world and Israel. And now it's time to hear from our audience. Who has our first question? Right over there. I have a 15 year old daughter that reads the Bible. Recently, she told me that she's afraid of the book of Revelations. What advice would you give her? Uh, well, you could visit revelationforkids.com. We have some resources like a Bible study workbook on the seven churches. It's a very easy introduction to Revelation and it's a very simple way to start kind of reading the book and not be intimidated by it. Or take the Read Revelation Challenge. Excellent. Any advice you have? Uh, tell your daughter that the first chapter of the book of Revelation says there's a blessing on those who read the book and ask her just to pray to God and say, Lord, help me not to be afraid. Help me to find Jesus in this book and then start reading. That's right. Any other questions? Right over there. Is there only one version of the Bible or do different denominations of Christians follow different versions? There are a lot of versions in the Bible, uh, of the Bible. Uh, there is controversy also about which version is a better version 
Uh, personally, the Bible that I read is the, it's actually called the King James Easy Reader Bible. I believe God can use any translation, but I think some are more accurate than others. Any other questions? Right over there. Uh, my question is for Steve. What did you speak about when you were invited to the Pentagon? Great question. I will show you one Bible verse. And what I did, I was told I could speak, it was a chaplain of the Pentagon, William Broom, that invited me to give a talk on prophecy. And it wasn't in front of the whole Pentagon. There's like 25,000 people that work in the Pentagon. He had a Wednesday morning prayer breakfast that was volunteer for those that wanted to come and hear a speaker talk about the Bible. So he uh, commissioned me to, to talk about prophecy. So I picked one verse, Revelation 13, verse 11, that says, I beheld another beast, which I interpret to be a nation. Uh, coming up out of the earth, he had two horns like a lamb, and he spoke like a dragon. And I, I spent 45 minutes explaining why I believe this applies to the United States, to a nation rising up out of a wilderness type of an area down near the end times. It has uh, a division of power, and it's like a lamb, which reveals that it has Christian principles uh, of freedom, uh, and sacrifice, and yet in the final days, it will compromise those principles, use force, and speak as a dragon. So I, I talked for 45 minutes, I recorded the whole talk, put it on our website. Our supporters were just electrified that I had a chance to do this. And uh, so it was American prophecy. That was my focus, and the response of the people was very, very positive. I actually gave them a, a a printout, and I said, feel free to give this to the president if you'd like, which was President Bush at that time. I don't know if they ever did that, but uh, that, was, that was my focus. Now, Steve, you also wrote this book, Israel and the End of the World, Separating Fact from Fiction. What's this book about? It's about, Besides what the title obviously tells yeah, us. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's about the Middle East, and it's about uh, the war, and it's about um, the New Testament and showing the difference between fact and fiction, that the, the popular evangelical Christian focus on the Jewish state as the center of end time events, that that's really not a teaching that can be supported by the New Testament or by the book of Revelation. You know, I've always had this belief that many people who are trying to prevent their version of how the world is going to end will bring about the actual version of how the world will end. You know, and I think a lot of this revolves around a misunderstanding of Bible prophecy, specifically in regards to literal Israel. Israel so. Right, yeah, and I, and I talk about that too, the, about the end itself, and the end is not, again, it's not uh, a bloody Middle East battle against the Jews. It's ultimately the return of Jesus and his uh, conquering the global forces of evil in this world. Mm -hmm. That's what we really are looking forward to. Interesting. Any other questions? I was wondering if you still hold your Revelation Bible study. I don't do the one that I started with. So right now I'm more focused on writing materials that will help other people, uh, other parents and teachers to teach their kids. So I don't have my own uh, Bible study right now, but I have materials on Bible study that other people can use. Uh, Shama, when it comes to the study of the book of Revelation, you're studying with people, how, what's the framework of that? How does that look? Do you start with chapter one and just make your way all the way to the end? How does that look? Uh, that's the way I prefer actually, is starting with chapter one and just going chapter by chapter and as you do that, you bring in many other parts of the Bible. You bring in things from the gospel. You bring in things from the book of Daniel. You bring in things even from Genesis. So, but I do like the method of going chapter by chapter, verse by verse. Steve, how about you? When you're studying the book of Revelation, how, how, what's the trajectory <laughs> you take in studying this book out? I don't really have a tra trajectory. I bounce around, I've been bouncing around. And my wife recently got a uh, chronological Bible and she's been reading it, you know, chapter by chapter all the way through the Bible in one year. So I started doing that. But I don't, I don't really have a general method. Uh, I, I study different things, I, I, but I, I love Revelation and I, I tend to gravitate toward what I think I need at the time. Sometimes it's the book of Psalms, Proverbs, Revelation. So there's lots of different ways to study the Bible. And I think, you know, people are unique and they, they have different methods 
of studying God's Word. Any other questions? Right over there. What are your thoughts on the murder of innocent children in the Middle East? That's a good question, especially in regards to the conflict, current conflict that's going on. Yeah, that's not a difficult question for me to answer. Uh, I, I believe strongly in the Ten Commandments. The Sixth Commandment says, do not murder. And I think that any murder of any child anywhere in the world by anybody is, uh, is hideous and wrong in the sight of God. Now, they, people who do that can be forgiven because God is merciful if we turn away from our sin, but it's ghastly and it's wrong. And I'm looking forward to the day when those things don't happen anymore. Appreciate you saying that because especially in light of politics, people like to immediately defend one side or the other side and it's like, no, this is a big issue here. Yeah, that's right. This breaks God's heart too. That's right. Any other questions? Right over there. Will the faithful suffer in the end times? And how does Jesus recommend that Christians face persecution? Um, and furthermore, would it be possible for non-believers to convert to Christianity in the end? Well, if we look at uh, history, I mean, we look at the apostles, um, they did not want to go through persecution or trials, but they, they did, all of them did. And we look through all of history that God's people have faced tribulation. Um, Jesus said, in this world, there will be tribulation but take care that I have overcome the world. So none of us want to face persecution, but um, he will give us the strength that we need at the time to face whatever it is we need to face. So he doesn't say there won't be any problems, but he says that he'll be with us to the end. He said, I will be with you till the very end. And there is a time now to for anyone to come to Christ. And I think he'll make it very clear at the very end of time. It'll be very clear that there's two sides and that everyone will have a chance to make a decision on who am I gonna follow, which method of government, which principles do I wanna follow um, so that everyone will have a chance. But I do think there will come a time and the Bible makes it clear there will be a time where Jesus stands up and says, um, this is the this is the end. Let those who are clean be clean, and those who are filthy be still filthy. So there will be a time where it's not that you don't have a chance, but everyone's mind will be set so that they will continue in that path that they're on. And he knows when that time is. So the the message is don't put it off. Don't put it off because whatever way you're going, you're going to be set in that way of thinking. So now is the time to repent and to ask Jesus into your life. That's right. We got time for another question right over there. When did you start reading the Bible and how did it change your life? For me personally, I started reading when I was 20 years old. And how it changed me was in a simple way was that God used the Bible to convict my conscience uh, of the things that I was doing that were wrong. And then he also uh, revealed himself to me as a God of love who wants to forgive me and help me to live a different life. So really it was through reading and it was through, I believe the spirit of God working through the Bible and the words getting into my conscience and into my heart and they began to change me. So I made a choice to give up the bad. I want the good. I want God in my life. I asked him to come into my heart and I, I have no question that he did. And he's been changing me ever since. Mm -hmm. How about you, Shama? Well, I grew up in a Christian home, so I was familiar with a lot of Bible stories throughout my life. And so I, I began to read the Bible probably in my teenage years but I was more reading it for what can it do for me? Like, you know, I would read the Psalms like, oh, I need a promise or I need, it was always like me centered and not um, who is God. And it wasn't until my thirties that I really started reading the Bible. Like who is, who is Jesus? Who is God? What is he all about? Do I really believe him? Do I really trust him? And it was at that point that it really changed my life. And I, just came to a realization of God's love and his forgiveness and his mercy. And at that point, 
it was just a love of God that really changed my life. And, it, and like Steve said, it, it started to convict me of things that I needed to surrender and give up in my life that were not benefiting me or others, you know, in my life. And it really changed. Uh, change is not always easy, but it's, it was always for the better. Right. Yeah. When you yeah. go through the Word, the Word goes through you. Right. Yeah. And it, it doesn't always happen overnight. Sometimes it takes time, but if you just stick with it, keep reading, keep trusting, keep praying, uh, God works step by step. It's a continual process. Excellent. Shama, Steve, thank you so much for sharing this refreshing journey in the Bible into the book of Revelation. It's been great. 